Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. If you are here for the automation and malware analysis, you're in the right place. Uh, I'm gonna be the moderator today, Commander Jake Galbraith. I work here at CCD COE at the strategic branch. Uh, I'm professional IT in the United States Navy, uh, and most of my tours have been operational in the Pacific uh, in Japan and the South China Sea. So I have the pleasure of introducing the topics and then the speakers. The format will be, uh, after the introduction, speakers will have about 25 minutes to do their presentation. I'll do a question and answer session at the end of each presentation. And if we have time, we'll do a bigger question and answer session at the very end, okay? Uh, topics today will be, uh, Philip Charlin will be doing Jarvis phenotype clone search for rapid zero day malware, triage and functional decomposition for cyber threat intelligence. Uh, to his right, uh, Stefan Enders will do rethinking decomposition for malware analysis. And to his right at the end, uh, Jake Norwood, business as usual, a response uh, to the cyber criminal to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Please come on in, have a seat, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, first up, our first uh, guest speaker here is uh, to my immediate right, Philip Tarlin, is a defense scientist at Defense Research and Development Canada of uh, Volcartier Research Center in the Mission Critical Cybersecurity Section, where he leads the Systems Vulnerabilities and Lethality Group. His research, research focuses on software reverse engineering, more specifically on the development of binary analysis tools to accelerate the reverse engineering process involved in malware and embedded system software analysis. Mr. Charlin holds a bachelor and master's degree in computer science, both from Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Sir, please. <clears throat> Thank you for the uh, introduction. So uh, Defense Research and Development Canada is an organization within the uh, Department of National Defense. So today I will present you the uh, Jarvis tool which uh, implements a new approach called Phenotype Clone Search, which can be used for malware triage and uh, cyber threat intelligence. So I will start my presentation by giving you some uh, background information which will uh, highlight the motivation behind our work. Then I will present the, uh, our contribution. I will explain what uh, phenotype plant search and how it can be used to analyze malware. Then I will give you the results of a, an experiment we conducted uh, using Jarvis uh, where we analyze uh, malware samples. And at the end of my presentation, I will give you, uh, I will show you a short uh, YouTube video, which gives you a short demonstration of uh, the Jarvis uh, tool. So at uh, Defense Research and Development Canada, we don't do everything internally, so we collaborate with the universities, among others, either through uh, contracts or partnerships. So um, the work that I will present you to do it today is an example of uh, such a collaboration. So uh, the Jarvis tool was uh, developed in collaboration with uh, McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and uh, Queen's University uh, from Kingston, also in uh, Canada. Uh, nowadays, uh, since there are so much open source code, re uh, open source code available, uh, code reuse is a, a common practice in uh, software development, and the same thing applies for, uh, for malware development, because uh, malware authors, they don't want to start their development process from scratch. They want to reuse as much code as possible. And uh, malware samples, which have a similar high-level behaviors, are considered variants of the same family. And over the years, uh, malware uh, variants have uh, exponentially uh, increased, both in uh, terms of uh, volume and uh, threat potential. So just to give you an idea, so the uh, AV Test uh, Institute uh, identified in uh, 2021 more than 21 million new malware variants that they were targeting the uh, Microsoft Windows operating system. 
and the uh, Emonet uh, malware has now more than 70,000 70, variants, and uh, each uh, Emonet malware incident can cost up to uh, uh, 1 million to, uh, to clean up. And the reason why we have so many variants is because uh, malware authors uh, play a cat and mouse game with the antivirus engine. So a malware author will uh, write some, uh, some malware. At one point, this malware will get detected by antivirus engine. So the malware author will modify it slightly to be able to bypass the antivirus detection. The, the motivations are slight, but uh, they, they, they preserve uh, the uh, functionalities of the malware, and then the uh, malware engine will start detecting this new new variant and its uh, ongoing uh, ongoing process. Um, one process which is really important in uh, malware triage is to be able to match unknown variants to their malware families, and also to identify. Uh, new malware from unknown families. The reason why this is so important is because uh, this will um, uh, help you to, to decide where to put your effort. So let's say that you encounter a new, uh, a new malware variant of a family you know very well because you have analyzed it in the past. Maybe you will not spend too much time analyze, analyzing it compare if, if you encounter a, 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 a novel uh, malware which doesn't belong to any previous uh, malware family that you have seen in the past. So there are, there are existing approach to malware triage, such as a dynamic analysis, signatures, and uh, machine learning. So each approach has its pros and cons. Um, the problem with dynamic analysis is that um, some malware, they have uh, anti-sandboxing techniques, so they are able to detect when they are being executed in a virtual environment. And in this case, they, they will uh, avoid launching their malicious payload. Uh, in the case of signatures, um, some malware uh, ha use uh, certain techniques to impede the signature extraction, uh, extracting process. And, uh, machine, and to address this problem, uh, machine learning techniques have been proposed. But the one limitation that they have is they uh, don't provide any, exp any explainability with their classification result. So you know the result, but you don't know uh, what was used to, to, to come up with this, uh, with this result. So, um, to complement the existing approaches and to address some of their limitations, um, we uh, propose a new approach called phenotype clone search. Uh, phenotype are basic elements of observable characteristic extracted from a uh, given malware sample. So examples of uh, phenotypes are code fragments, <coughs> constants, and uh, strings. Um, Phenotypes can be uh, directly observed without sandboxing or emulation. And since they can be directly observed, they can be easily interpreted. Um, as I said uh, previously, uh, malware variants of the same family share a similar code base. So our assumption is that malware variants of the same family will share uh, many uh, phenotypes. So this is how phenotype clone search uh, works. So given a uh, malware to analyze, we will extract all its functions. And for each function, we will extract all its phenotypes. And we will try to match these phenotypes with phenotypes of functions which are contained in a repository of uh, non-malware. And we will repeat this process for all the uh, functions of the uh, of the malware, and at the end, we will aggregate all the results. And this will give us uh, the, um, the, 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 the malware family to which the malware sample uh, belongs to. Uh, this can also tell uh, us uh, the, the behaviors of the malware and the APT group to which uh, it belongs. So I will give you an example using the uh, D-Track malware sample. So the uh, D-Track malware is a remote administration tool malware which has been found in a nuclear power plant. 
So the sample that we analyzed contained more than 11,000 functions that uh, come from common code found in bin benign non-malicious malware. So later on in my tr presentation, I will explain you how we are able to determine this. And of the remaining function, 663 function, 563 functions were found in function from the sample from samples of the same uh, family. And what's interesting is that uh, we also um, there was a common uh, malware code share with other families as well. So this is an example of a visualization that uh, Jarvis provides. So the uh, sample that we analyzed contained 1,897 functions. So you see at the top of the image. So th this is a, a tree map view. So um, there was uh, 1,136 functions that were non-malicious and uh, 563 functions that were coming from uh, the DTRAC uh, malware family. And as you can see at the back, uh, there was also 99 functions that were from the Cobalt uh, Strike uh, malware. So uh, our contribution uh, as part of this work is that we propose a novel approach to malware functional decomposition to complement existing uh, malware triage solutions like dynamic signature and machine learning based <coughs> techniques. Uh, we implemented this uh, new approach in a new distributed clone search based analytic framework. And we also provide a uh, interactive and scalable visualization to decompose a target uh, malware into known functionalities. So to perform a malware functional decomposition, we need to perform two steps. The first one is indexing and the second one is analysis. So indexing is where you build your repository of known malware or if you have an existing repository, um, you will add uh, additional malwares to your, uh, to your repository. And once this is done, you can uh, conduct a decomposition analysis uh, for a target malware sample. So as part of the indexing, we need to perform uh, extraction steps for each malware sample to index. So if the malware has been packed, we unpack it. After that, we disassemble it using a disassembler such as the IDA Pro or Ghidra. Then we will uh, extract the phenotypes so again, the phenotypes are the code fragment, constants, and strings. And we will take all the phenotypes extracted uh, from the, the different malware, and we will index them in the um, Elasticsearch uh, cluster. So uh, once we're done with uh, the indexing, we can perform the uh, analysis. So. Um, so the, the first step consists of extracting the phenotypes for each function of the target malware sample. And after that, that we will search for clones of each function in a collection of non-malicious executables. So uh, at the beginning, um, when I, I explained, uh, I talked about the, 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 the D-Track malware sample, uh, I said that we were able to uh, identify that 11 uh, 100 functions were non-malicious. That's because we have a repository of non-malicious executable. And when we analyze a new malware, so we will try to find clones of its function in this uh, collection of software executable. And if there is a match that has been found, so we discard this function because we know that this function will not help us to determine the malware family to which the uh, malware belong. So, so during step two, we eliminate a certain uh, number of functions and of the remaining function, we would search the phenotypes for the remaining function in our malware repository. So uh, 
precisely the uh, phenotypes that you are using are two grams of assembly instructions, three grams of assembly instruction, the strings, and the constants. And uh, all the constants are uh, converted in uh, hexadecimal uh, format. <coughs> So, uh, so the search method is a combination of the OKP BM25 and the TF-IDF function. So uh, BM25, it's a function which is used a lot for uh, text retrieval uh, techniques. Uh, it is used in uh, Elasticsearch. So um, we use both function because in some cases the uh, BM25 give a very um, uh, interesting result, but in some circun circumstances the results are not that great. So since we're combining the two uh, the two methods, we are getting the uh, the better of both uh, worlds. So the methods are combined to generate a similarity score between the search and the stored phenotypes and the family to which the majority of the functions belong to is the attributed family. So we conducted an experiment uh, using 200,000 malware samples and 100,000 benign samples. And the malware samples were grouped based on their families. So there were approximately 394 families. Uh, it took 43 hours to unpack, disassemble, and index all the samples. The, what takes most time is the uh, disassembly because we rely on existing tools like Ida Pro and uh, Ghidra, and we have no way to, to, to improve uh, the time it takes to disassemble a, uh, all the files. And uh, to simulate um, unknown malware families, what we call the zero-day malware families. We had a separate set of malware samples that were not included in our repository of known malware. So here you have the um, different uh, data set that we use. So we have our uh, known malware repository. You have a list of some of the malware families. We have the list of our benign repository with some of the uh, executables that were part of it. And then we have our zero day set of malware. So you see that uh, the malware families in the zero day set were not included in our repository of known malware. And here you have the results of our analysis. So, um, all the zero-day uh, malware samples were found in uh, the zero-day malware families. In other words, uh, there were no uh, zero-day malware samples that were found in the uh, known repository of, uh, of malware. So this is very good. The precision is quite good. Uh, we got uh, some false positive for the uh, Fatula and the uh, Renault Floss uh, families. Um, so this is an example of a result that we were able to get. Um, so in this case, uh, the malware sample uh, consisted of 356 functions. Uh, 156 uh, function belong to the Evora family and 145 to the Fatula family. And since uh, the Evora family was the family which contained the most uh, function, then we, uh, the tool uh, determined that this uh, particular uh, malware sample belonged to the Evora family. So uh, as part of the experiment results, so the majority of the malware families were correctly matched. Uh, it was a 100% ratio. Uh, there were two false negatives for the uh, Fatula uh, family and one false negative for the Renal Floss family. And um, if I go back to this, uh, to this result, so um, 
if it was, so in this case, we treated uh, these malware samples uh, as unknown malware, but in reality, we knew what they were. But if we had really used unknown malware, so we, ha we, we would have obtained the same uh, similarity matrix, but the only difference is that uh, we wouldn't have any labels. So the only thing that we would know is that uh, Let's say, um, uh, so there were a certain number of families and uh, all the uh, malware samples belonging to this family had never been seen in our previous, uh, they, they were not in our previous uh, repository of known malware. So uh, now I will show you uh, a quick uh, YouTube video which uh, gives you a short uh, demonstration of the uh, Jarvis tool uh, in action. So this video was uh, produced by uh, a student from uh, Queen's University. This is the main user interface for Jarvis. Assets can be organized into searchable repositories and task-driven projects. In this demo, we use the GW2 repo as an example. Here, we see a list of projects. Basically, they are virtual folders containing the malwares. Here, we name them based on the malware family. Let's have a look at the RenoFloss family. This folder contains some RenoFloss malware and analytic results under the tree view. In this interactive interface, you can inspect the disassembled content by clicking on one of the assets. Here on the left, you can find a full list of assembly functions for this malware. Clicking any of them will bring us to its assembly code on the right. <coughs> At the same time, the system will show similar functions searched in real time on the right hand side. Let's have a look at the decomposition analysis. Going back to the project, we can see that there is a composition result associated with this malware. It shows the decomposition tree of the analysis. There are 10,933 functions in total, with over 8,000 of them that are matched to benign libraries. Clicking on the benign rectangle, we can see what libraries are matched to the benign code. And going back to the full view, we can see that about 1,400 functions have been found from the RenoFloss family. And clicking it, we can see that one of them, or all of them, have been matched to this specific RenoFloss file. On the right, we can see a list of assembly functions extracted from this binary. Clicking on one entry will show the matched functions. Malware decomposition analysis enables us to inspect how code is reused and shared among malware, enabling a deeper insight for threat analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the first question. Um, fascinating. Um, has your team thought about maybe using this kind of application in a general binary repository, like a, a Linux binary distribution, or maybe like off of GitHub, where the general consensus, or at least the general thought in many government and commodity uh, biz businesses that, hey, we can't trust open source software, there might be embedded code and all that. So I'm curious, have, uh, like, are you planning on broadening out the repositories of what you might use as a sample? To like, I'm sure Microsoft might be interested in you running this on Microsoft Store or Apple or some other things. Because we have, uh, this is one of uh, many tools that we develop, so we have uh, other tools that we don't talk about it publicly that uh, are doing the kind of thing that you're proposing. Perfect. So each tool has its specific uh, purpose. Okay, since you said it was top secret and I can't, you can't answer it, I, I'm gonna ask you a different question. Uh, we, we saw a couple false positives. Um, so I guess my next question would be, uh, of the benign code that you may have identified, um, 
how often you go back and maybe resample this or maybe do, uh, do peer cross-checking to see if the code is in truly benign, because that could be an indication of a yes. false positive. So uh, like in any tool you have, you will have false positives, but in the case of your benign samples, the larger your set is, the less uh, false positives you, you, you will have. Thank you, sir. I don't want to take all the questions, please. Uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, anybody else in the audience? I could ask so many questions. Please, sir. Hello. Marcus Marmom, NATO SIOC. Um, first of all, very impressive research that you did. Um, let me take from a threat hunting perspective. We usually always look at the red side, what they would do to evade those detection techniques. So in your case, we would try to uh, enhance the uh, false positives. So what would the attacker do actually to evade your analysis? Maybe just add random functions so that the, the set of functions would, would increase? Uh... Yeah, it's um, be because uh, you, you see w when you, when you have a, a, a malware sample and you are generating uh, variants of this malware sample, you, you can modify it to some extent, but it still has to to perform its uh, malicious functions. So they they are uh, certain. Uh, you you cannot change the malware from A to to Z because it will uh, it will not suit your your purpose. So um, that's why we uh, our assumption, that I stated in my presentation, is that uh, malware variants they share the source code and they will share many phenotypes maybe not all of them but we believe that they will share many phenotypes but uh, like uh, like any solution it's not uh, bulletproof it's like uh, you know you know the uh, virus total uh, website so uh, some people, they uh, modify their malware, they upload it to, uh, on the, the website, and they see how many uh, antivirus uh, detect their new, vir uh, the, their new variant, and they, uh, they keep modifying it until they are satisfied with the results. So the same thing could apply here, but since we are not at the, um, since we are looking at uh, the phenotypes, you know, the uh, contained in the functions, I believe this approach is more robust to, uh, to the different techniques that the malware authors are using to bypass uh, antivirus uh, engines. Thank you uh, very much. One more round of applause for Philip. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll try to get to another question and answer at the very end if we have time. Uh, I'd like to introduce my next uh, guest speaker. Stefan Enders is a security researcher at Fraunhofer FKIE Cyber Analysis and Defense Department and a PhD candidate at the University of Bonn. His PhD research focuses on developing new decomp uh, compilation approaches to facilitate malware analysis and program analysis in general. Simultaneously, Stefan is also involved in various teaching activities at the University of Bonn and HBRS in St. Augustine. Thank Please, you. floor is yours. All right, so my topic today is rethinking decompilation for malware analysis. Um, for those of you who know decompilation, they know this is a highly technical um, topic, so I try to break it down to a more high level, um, high level problem. So um, first of all, before we start, a few words about myself and about my employer. So I'm with Fraunhofer FKE. For those of you who, know, who don't know Fraunhofer, it's uh, Europe's largest um, organization for applied research. and um, well, I'm working at the Department for Cyber Analysis and Defense at Fraunhofer FKE, where we have um, different working groups aiming at reaction, prevention, and detection of cyber attacks. And yeah, I myself work at uh, malware analysis and intelligence, um, somewhere between reaction and prevention. So um, as introduced, I'm also a PhD candidate at University of Bonn, and um, both during my day job and um, during my PhD studies, I'm focusing on research about malware, program analysis and um, decompilation especially. So um, yeah, the most, two, um, the most two important projects right now for myself are the DWOLF decompiler, which you're gonna see in the final part of this talk, and also um, Mylpedia, which some of you may already know. 
Um, it's basically an encyclopedia for, um, for malware. So we just heard about um, malware families and um, that one malware family basically is like a code base for, um, for a given, like a software base for a given malware fam and um, well, at Melpedia, we try to track all of all the versions of um, the same malware and um, and um, annotate them with some um, references, Yara rules, and so on. So, I suggest to check it out if you don't already know it. So, I probably don't have to tell you that um, malware is more important than ever. So, there are um, individuals, companies, states, hospitals, universities. Um, they are all attacked by by cyber threats, um, there's malware everywhere. Um, if you take a look at the latest AV test statistics, um, we already surpassed the number of um, one billion total unique malware samples, which um, with millions um, with new with millions of new malware samples each year. And um, this is already the first main challenge, in my opinion, in malware analysis. So we just have too much malware that we are not able to analyze. Um, and on the other hand, the second major challenge is that well, we have too much malware and we have too few analysts. And this is because malware analysis is highly, it's a very complex topic. Um, it requires years of exercise and training. So for all of you who try to find a good reverse engineer, you should probably know that it's not easy to find one, um, and that there are very few on, on this planet. So yeah, those are the two main challenges. And at Fraunhofer, we thought, what can we do to solve this, to counter the steadily increasing number of malware samples? And um, we came up with two basic solutions. So on the one hand, we want to simplify analysis so that, um, that more people would be able to analyze malware and not only those who had been exercising and um, doing this for years. And on the other hand, also support the analysis of those. So yeah, and the great thing, and this is also why I showed this for my PhD studies, is that by improving decompilation, we can actually do both. So we can ease analysis and we can also support experienced analysts. So um, I was talking about decompilation a lot, so let me first, um, first explain what decompilation actually is. So if, let's say a, a, malware, a malware author is writing new malware, so um, some arbitrary threat actor. Um, the way this works is that um, as for usual computer programs, you would write it in some kind of source code, like on the slide in, in the C language, and then it has to be compiled to binary code using a compiler. And um, there is a substantial information loss during, during compilation. So um, there are just some things that are not necessary for execution, like the variable names or um, function names that have been assigned by the developer. Um, so be aware that um, this process is by nature not reversible. Um, well, and then as in memory analysis, you are given this executable code and have to analyze it because the source code is apparently and obviously not distributed um, because only the sample, the um, executable code is needed to be ran to cause, to cause some damage. Yeah, so the question is how to analyze the executable code. So the first step would be to use a disassembler to get back the assembly code. So, so each byte sequence of the executable binary code corresponds to certain assembly instructions. And you'll end up with the assembly code like displayed on the right on the slide, um, which is still pretty, well, pretty low level and hard to read. Um, many years ago, malware analysis when decompilers weren't around, or at least not um, as advanced as today's, we're just using this assembly language to analyze malware, and it requires years of training to be able to um, adequately understand this, because it's so low level, there are no concepts like variables or conditions, only um, stack usages, registers, and flags. So this is where decompilers come into place. The goal of a decompiler is to derive a more high-level representation. So we essentially want something like we had before, something like, um, like C code, that um, is easier to understand, that is made for humans to be understand and to be written. Um, and this can then be used especially for manual analysis, but also for some automated approaches. Um, and as you can see on this example, the variable names already don't have the original ones because they were lost during compilation, so the decompiler has to choose um, how to replace those information that have been lost. 
Um, yeah, so basically decompilation is very complex, but also essential for malware analysis. As I said, there is an there is a substantial information loss during compilation, but that's not all. We also have various compiler optimizations, which um, which actually aggravate the decompilation process and aggravate analysis on assembly level. Um, so because it's such a highly complex complex field, there are not that many approaches for decompilation, but there are some. Um, I think many or most of you um, have heard of GDRA, which is the, um, the binary analysis framework from the NSA. And then there's also the, um, the commercial state of the AD compiler hex race, which is integrated in IDA Pro and basically used by everyone who's professionally reversing malware. So yeah, there are a bunch of others, um, especially research decompilers, each having their flaws. And all in all, which led to our, res what led to our research, is that at Fraunhofer we think there is still a lot of room for improvements because um, none of those existing approaches are optimal yet and um, produce optimal results for malware analysis. And um, this is one major challenge when, um, when dealing with the increasing number of samples. Yeah, so what we try to do is we wanted to try to find out what um, aspects in the compilation we, we should improve. So most naturally, we thought, let's get in touch with, um, with some more professionals, ask some professional reverses, um, and then let's assess the current limitation of, limitations of approaches. So um, yeah, basically leverage on, on domain knowledge of all kinds of people. And um, two main questions we asked ourselves was, how can we support automated approaches that they're already using or that they're working on, um, and how to increase readability for manual analysis? The thing about automated versus manual analysis is that, in our opinion at Fraunhofer, um, you can only automate things to, to a certain extent and oftentimes have to resort to manual analysis eventually. So this is why we try to aim at both and not only support um, automation, but also and especially manual analysis. Well, and the final thing that I'd like to mention here is that we not only included reverses, so um, we also asked and included people especially, especially without um, reversing knowledge, but programming knowledge, because ultimately what we want to reach is a decompiler that, um, that allows people, even without reversing skills, without assembly skills, to analyze real-world malware, because this way we could yeah, increase the number of analysts and the number of samples that can be analyzed. So I could talk hours about the results from those surveys. Um, we did a total of three of them one in uh, the end of 2020 and two the last year. Um, as you may notice, the number of participants is quite low. Um, however, this is, this is just because there are so few reversers there and um, even fewer who agree to, to uh, participate in a survey that um, takes yeah, quite an amount of time. So we were told that a survey should not last um, longer than five minutes. However, um, for those of you who know you, um, who some, um, sometime reverse some sample, it's just not possible to do anything in five minutes. So we tried to aim at one hour, ended up with a median of two hours in our first survey. Um, we were able to bring it down to um, under one hour, but that's basically the best you can do um, for such a specific and technical topic. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is I want to focus on the two key results um, we observed and found out during our surveys and how we can use them to improve decompilation and how others could use them to improve decompilation for malware analysis. So the first key result is um, one thing that participants even mentioned without being asked um, already in the first survey is um, that current approaches in decompilers are not configurable enough. And this is very surprising and unintuitive because configurability is um, very essential for many kinds of tools. Um, I put two very um, practical examples on the slide. So um, let's say we have this adjustable wrench on, on the right. Um, of course, it has to be adjustable um, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to adjust it for the situation and tighten every type of screw or um, every size of screw. Then also, like for the office chair, you sometimes have to have to um, adjust your tool for um, the given use case, or even more specific, when talking manual analysis, um, each each 
type of analysis from, from two different people may, be, may vastly differ from each other. So they may be using different, a different methodic or um, they just are used to different things. So you can, you can considerably increase effectiveness from their analysis when allowing them to adjust the tools to their needs. So those are the two main reasons why we need configurability in decompilation. Let's take a look at um, two examples. So um, the first one is, is quite simple. So we have um, the topic constant representation. Um, if we have some constant values in um, decompiler output, um, the decompiler basically has to decide how to display them in the output C code. And um, well, there are different options. Let's say we have an integer value. You can see on the left that um, for the sample, we can choose between a character representation or a hexadecimal representation. So all of those values um, have been in the ASCII range, so can also be displayed at characters. And because in this sample, um, we actually compare individual letters of a string, it makes sense to use the first option because those are actually characters, and this, this, as, so displaying um, constants this way may facilitate analysis. On the other side, on, on the right side, in sample two, we are calculating a number, so we don't want to have a, a char representation, although you might display the value um, 65 as a capital A. So it really just depends on the situation you're in and on the sample you're dealing, and um, this is just a very, very simple example of why this should be configurable in decompilers. Um, the second one, maybe a little bit more interesting, is um, that we should also be able to optimize depending on use case. So as I said, um, depending on whether we have a um, automated approach or manual approach, we want to have a different kind of output. So this is actually the same sample that has been decompiled with um, identical configurations except for one option, except for the out of SSA algorithm that we used. And um, as you can see, changing this single option produces a drastically, dif a drastically different output. So on the left, we have a quite low level representation because we use a very simple out of SSA algorithm. This may be beneficial for some automated approaches that um, don't, don't profit from um, too many abstraction layers. On the other side, option two is um, well, pretty much more high level. We um, concluded certain variables and um, well, have drastically fewer lines of code that the analysts have to analyze. So again, we have to optimize depending on use case. The second key result we, we observed, or where we first observed it and then we um, validated it using the survey, is that right now many decompilers try to reconstruct the original source code as good as they can. However, this isn't, this isn't always what we want. So because as I told you, the, um, the compilation process has a heavy information loss. So a real one-to-one -one reconstruction isn't even possible, so why bother trying? Instead, what we should do and what decompilers should do is they, they should focus on how the output is used and then try to come up with the best representation for it. So right now, they try to stick to assembly very much, but this may not just not be optimal. So let's think of a practical example. So um, on the slide, you can see um, where we are right now, so a map of Tallinn. And well, I think we can all agree that this um, Google Maps image is a quite detailed representation of, of where we are right now. Um, however, depending on the use case, so let's say we want to find a way from here to, to some other point, this might just not be optimal because you can't properly identify which streets are which, are there one-way streets, which ones are the fastest. So you might want to choose a completely different, different representation, which is in our case more abstract, annotated with some other informations, and um, most important in our use case, easier to pass for navigation. Let's take a look at how this might, um, might look in decompiler output. Um, here we have, again, the same function, which has been um, decompiled using a um, different approach. So on the left, we can see um, the result produced by Jitra, um, which is pretty much what the assembly looks like. Uh, so the structure is pretty much implied by the assembly. And um, what happens here is that um, a variable is, is compared to various numbers. And the thing is that for this kind of, um, for, of code structure, we have a more, specific, a more specific variant in C. We could also use a switch construct. 
And um, well, what we try to do is we, um, instead of focusing on assembly, just come up with the best representation for the sample. And this leads us to um, through the right side, which I hope um, you can see is just a little bit cleaner and um, better comprehensible when um, looked at by, by a human analyst. The second example may be um, one uh, different type of restructuring. So um, again, it's the same function. On the left, you can see an option that some decompilers are using. Um, basically, we have an inserted go-to um, where um, it jumps to a given label. So you can have the same kind of code and jump from different locations to it. Um, however, this is, um, well, again, when considering manual analysis, that's not the best option because go-tos are very hard to read and aggravate following the control flow. Um, so some decompilers came up with, with a different approach and just copied the code at the given location. So in the middle, we have um, the same output using, de using duplication. Um, however, again, this is still not optimal because, um, well, if you ins insert duplicates without marking them, um, analysts have to waste time, analyze them twice, and well, don't, even, don't even know it sometimes. So a third way that we may use, it's not nothing we've done yet, but um, something we thought of is you could alternatively just um, introduce a new function that's not there in assembly. So we somehow discard the, the information from the assembly we have and instead insert calls. And we received in our survey, in our final survey, we received po very positive feedback from, um, from professional reversers that something like this may, may be beneficial during manual analysis even if not imposed by the assembly. So what we came up with is um, called the DWOLF decompiler. So it's basically a research decompiler, um, which is already highly configurable. We, we made sure that it's highly expandable and open sourced it just because we want it as a base for additional research, not only for ourselves, but also from other research, researchers because um, while we think decompilation is such a complex field, that we will not be able to solve it alone. We also published all server results. So for anyone who's interested, they're all um, published on GitHub, as is the source code. Um, well, and we're also currently writing a paper about it, um, which is not available yet, but it's pre-printed on archive. So a few words about DWOLF. I don't want to get too much into detail here. Um, so the main, the main algorithms, the main data flow and control flow algorithms are um, platform independent, so those are those, um, they are those in the middle in the pipeline, and um, this means they are portable to alternative architectures. Right now, we just focused on x86 and x64 due to the context of malware, but this can all be um, ported to different architectures very simply. Um, for the front end, so for the disassembling part, we didn't implement it ourselves, so we chose, but we chose um, Binary Ninja instead. Um, binary Ninja is also a um, binary analysis platform which actually is developing their own decompiler, but um, well, that's a different topic. So we use those, those um, disassembler and start off analysis on an intermediate language. And this just allows us that everything we do is platform independent and can be ported to different front ends. That's essentially the point I'm trying to make. So, as a conclusion, um, I and we at Fraunhofer really think that we should um, further improve decompilation to, um, to counter the steadily increasing number of malware samples. So, um, this could both benefit automated and manual approaches. This could, um, this could facilitate the analysis of professional reversers and this could allow more people to reverse malware. Um, as I showed you, current approaches still have many limitations two of them, um, configurability, and um, sticking to assembly. So we, we, need, we need more configurability and less sticking to assembly. Um, I presented you on the slides. So we ourselves, our contribution is for now that we introduce DWOLF to be used for future research, not only from ourselves, but also from other people. Um, by the way, if you know someone interested in decompilation and who might be able to partake in, in user surveys, we are always happy about new participants, so um, give them my contact info or just the email address dwolf at fkie um, Yeah, and again, as an outlook, key result implications 
future, re future decompilers should first really be configurable. As I already told you, it just allows optimizing the output based on the given situation and based on the given sample, um, also for a given use case. And finally, we should more focus on how the output is used and not to, um, and not to get a representation, an exact representation of the original source code. So this way, where well, maybe some, somebody else we didn't yet, but maybe somebody else is able to come up with an entirely alternative representation. Um, so yeah, but this is um, subject to future research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I'll ask you a quick question. We have a couple minutes for, uh, yeah, for sure. more. Uh, I'll just do something a little bit more simple. Uh, obvious choice for C or C++ kind of language output, uh, but other languages are growing more in popularity. You have uh, Google's Go, yeah. you have Mozilla's Rust, a couple other languages that do uh, specific data types. Uh, obviously, Python would probably not be very good for this. Uh, but uh, do you, have you, uh, looked back at uh, generated code versus the original code and see mismatches uh, by picking different languages such as C, C++. Uh, do you see a, uh, a need to maybe use, uh, I wouldn't say more modern language, these come and go, but <laughs> so, something like Go or Rust or some of the other ones uh, that may be a little bit more current? You mean for the output? Correct. Okay, so the thing is, as I, as I said, um, as I was trying to make a point, um, the main algorithms from the pipeline are all platform independent mm. and also independent from the back end, from, from the output language. So theoretically, one could produce an alternative language output. There are, um, there are researchers who actually produce Python output. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but we didn't try it out yet, no. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, lots of questions, awesome. I think, sir, you were first over here on the right, and then back, and then if we can, to you, sir, in the front. Uh, hi, Andrew Dwyer from Durham University in the UK. Absolutely hi. great presentation. But I'm wondering, in, in your user surveys in particular, whether you're going back to those reverse engineers and asking, is that helpful to them? Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the real difficulties, actually generating the insight about whether it's actually improving their capacity to work, right? And yeah. do user surveys capture that? And could we maybe look at doing other types of research to look at that? Um, <clears throat> well, the surveys were actually quite extensive. So we started out by just asking analysts and reversers what they would like us to improve. And then we, we um, tried out some, some improvements, implemented them in our research decompiler. And in the further, further um, studies and surveys, we actually compared them with um, the commercial and open source state of the art. So um, while in the first survey, we only um, ask what they want. In the second, we um, tried if they're helpful in the context of malware analysis. So we gave them a, um, a very short DGA function and had them analyze it. And then again, in the third survey, we compared it actually to um, GDRA and Hexrays to, um, to see how our output has um, well, advant advantages over the other ones. So yeah, if you're interested in those details, um, go check out the paper. <laughs> in the back, yes, sir. Um, hello, Peter Spikens from the University of Latvia. Uh, my question is about uh, the application of, of this, uh, like the compilers are used mostly to understand what the function does, not necessarily to get the actual source code. And given the context of the previous talk, like I would assume that most of the functions have already been analyzed by someone else because they were represented in previous malware. So have you, what's your opinion on applicability of getting historical data from other malware analysis? Yes, that's a good, good question. So the thing is, um, automated approaches can, in my opinion, automated approaches can only um, help analysis to a, certain, to a certain point during the analysis phase. So as you said, many things have already been analyzed, so it's important to identify them and to save valuable time, but eventually you will end up with, um, with cases where you have to analyze and get a deep understanding of a given binary and of a given function using a decompiler. So for example, if you have a new variant of, of ransomware, um, you eventually have to analyze some 
custom crypto routines that haven't been implemented, uh, haven't been analyzed before. So I think there is still a big need for decompilation. Thank you very much. One more round of applause. We'll get back to you if we can uh, at the end. One more round of applause, please. Thank you much. So, so we have just under five minutes left. I'd like to open the floor for general questions to any of the panelists uh, as seen fit. So anybody? Yes, sir. One more time. Uh, I was also uh, quite interested about the two previous uh, presentations. I'm kind of gray hair, and I have been in the business for something like uh, uh, 30 years now. Um, once upon a time, I remember the time there were uh, uh, these assemblers were forbidden, uh, mainly because they were used by uh, for people for reproducing software or for uh, you know uh, copying uh, trade secret or something like that. Uh, meaning that the tools, uh, both uh, the static analyzer, the static malware analyzer, and uh, also uh, the disassembler, are kind of dual usage tools that are helpful for the attacker, and eventually even more helpful for the attacker than for the defender, because the attacker <laughs> have to look at one specific piece of thing, <clears throat> where the defender have to look at the large scale. So uh, are we not going to help the attacker to become more efficient? That's a great question. I'm going to start with you, Philip. I think that falls in you a little bit. Um... Like for everything, everything has a dual purpose. So um, I don't know uh, what to say. Uh, it, it's, it's true that uh, attacker has a, um, to be successful, they only have to uh, identify one, uh, one weak point, uh, one vulnerability to exploit, whereas defender, they have to secure the whole perimeter. So. Attackers will always have the advantage, and the attackers are more willing to share information about them, whereas uh, we are like, like pr protecting our uh, know-how and, and secrets. So uh, yeah, so yeah. it's uh, we are at a disadvantage. Stefan, do you think uh, do you have an input on that? Um, yes. So I think it's a good question because it basically applies to many research fields. You always can say that the research, that the res results can be used for the good or the bad. But um, in my opinion, even though attackers only need one specific attack vector, we still help the good side the better and more um, by improving those tools. So I think after all, we should still be focusing on improving analysis and um, well, the anti-attacker side. I'm going to go ahead and stop here, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to please uh, talk to the speakers. So one more round of applause to everybody. Thank you so much.